Hello and welcome to the UFO Connection. I'm your host, Cynthia Siegel. Our show today is about a very important event, September 19, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill bringing on the beginning of the first official abduction reports. And we have an extraordinary honor tonight on our show because we have on, uh, as our guest, Betty Hill speaking with us all the way from New Hampshire about this landmark case and remarkable UFO sightings that have been going on for decades in the New Hampshire hills outside her home ever since this event has taken place. So please join me in this remarkable opportunity and honor to hear one of the most important people in UFO history, Betty Hill. Betty. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Hello. Hello. We are so honored to have you on our show. It's just amazing. We appreciate your giving us this time. Thank you. Now, you've had a lot of media attention, which in the beginning was not very welcome to you, was it, because of this abduction experience? Actually, uh, right after this happened, we were able to keep it quiet. Yes. For, for, how, for, for four years. Four years. Uh -huh. Boy, that's not easy. Now, what happened? Now, I, I understand you didn't willingly suddenly go public with this. What was no. the event? Uh, how it became known was an investigative reporter for a Boston newspaper mm -hmm. somehow heard about our experience. And it was published on the front pages of this Boston newspaper for five days. Wow. Five Without days. ever meeting us, we had to go to the store to buy the newspaper to see what was being said. Well, in fact, didn't this reporter approach you asking to interview you, and you refused? Right. He, he had contacted us. So he, we, we said we were not interested in publicity. Yeah. But he went behind your back anyway, and without your input, published these articles over a five-day period. What kind of an impression did or tone were the articles? How did he make you look to the public? Uh, actually, they were very accurate. Hmm. You know, he, whoever his source was, it was good. Okay. <laughs> So let, so he was accurate about the event, but how did the how did people react? Like what happened when this article said these articles suddenly appeared? Well, uh, this is in the early '60s. Were you worried about your reputation at that point? Not really. Actually, we didn't know even know the articles were going to be published. Hmm. And we came home, and the whole house is surrounded by reporters. Oh, oh, what a, that sounds awful. And we all said, what's happening? <laughs> and they said, you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're what's happening. <laughs> and so they brought the article of the newspaper in, and I grabbed it and ran in the bathroom and locked the door and read it. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep them away from you, huh? <laughs> I wanted to see, I wanted, first of all, I wanted to see what was being said. Yes. There. I wanted to see how accurate he was. Yes. And uh, I was amazed he was accurate. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. No. Now, let's, let's tell people um, what the actual event was. I know you're very seasoned at telling this story. As I said, it truly is. First of all, it's one of the most impeccable cases. There's a remarkable amount of physical evidence, and nobody has been able to dispute it. But right. it has many phases and components to it, so we're going to spend the whole first half of the show on that night and that event and what followed and the evidence that you came across afterwards. So if you could start us out, tell us where you were, what was okay. happening. September 19th, 1961. Barney and I are in Montreal, Canada, and we were planning to stay there overnight. But then, in late afternoon, we heard a weather report that there was a hurricane coming up the coast, and it might hit Portsmouth. Which is your hometown. Right. So we decided it, we, maybe we should head for home. Okay. So in late afternoon, we left Montreal, and... It was a leisurely drive home. We were in no hurry. And we just decided that if we became too tired on the way home, we'd pull off and have a little nap. But So we were in Colbert, New Hampshire, which is just over the line from Canada. 
Okay, on the way home. On the way home, and we stopped and had a snack to eat so that we always knew what time it was when we left. Okay. It was five minutes past ten. Okay. And then we started down through the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and no traffic, beautiful night, moon is full, bright, we're driving along, relaxed, because we'd been driving, we'd been in Canada for a few days before we went to Montreal. Yeah. And we're enjoying ourselves, and all of a sudden, I saw what I thought was a new star in the sky. Hmm. And you're a seasoned, experienced stargazer because of your beautiful open skies and, and clear skies in New Hampshire. Right. I was quite uh, well acquainted with the skies, generally. But this star was coming in next to the moon, and it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and brighter. Mm. So we were curious, so Barney stopped the car, and we got out to look at this star. And as we're looking at it, it changed direction and flew in front of the face of the moon. Mm. So we knew it wasn't a star at that point. What Could you make out the shape, or did it just appear round like a standard now, star? Uh, actually, we couldn't see a shape too much. But what we saw were multicolored beams of light shooting out from the craft. Wow. So it's really quite spectacular right in the beginning. My, even at that distance, you could see lights, multicolored lights. Yeah. Wow. And then, uh, while we're standing out there, well, first of all, we had our dog with us. Yes. You're... So I let the dog out of the car, and then I put the dog back in the car. And at that point, this object changed direction and began coming in towards us. Now, this was puzzling, because, first of all, 1961, I don't think either Barney and I had ever really, we'd heard something about flying saucers, mm -hmm. but we didn't know anything about them. Okay. And so, but we were curious about this craft. Okay. So there wasn't fear at that point, you just oh, kept no, pulling just off curiosity. of curiosity. The... Okay. Just and then, curious. actually, it followed us for about 30 miles. That's pretty and long. we would slow down, and it would, and it paced us. Oh. How far away was it at this point, Betty? Oh, not very far. Not very far? What and, does that and mean? Like, we're coming down through the mountains, uh -huh. and the highway would curve, mm -hmm. and the UFO would go straight over the mountain, come out to the end of the mountain, and sit there and wait for us. Oh, so it would pause in, and hover in midair and then start to move again. And when we saw it came up to it, it would start flying beside us. Now, wait, I still need to get an idea of how close we're talking. Are we talking um, airplane? Oh, no, no, no. Or, uh, airplane <laughs> height or star height or cloud height or... We're know. talking about, well, let's see, the mountains probably are four or 5,000 feet. Okay. And I would say the craft was 50, maybe 50 feet above the above the peaks. Okay. And the, the, the mountains, actually, on the, the roads, the highways are right there next to the, the mountains themselves. Yes, yes. You know, there's no space in between. Right, right. So it was close. And so we got to an area known as Indian Head. Just before we got to Indian Head, mm -hmm. this craft now is quite close to us. So and we're puzzled. And we have no fear. And I put the window down of the car and waved to it. <laughs> you waved to the UFO? Yeah. <laughs> Betty. <laughs> <laughs> well, about a half mile beyond that. Did you get any response? I know that sounds silly, but was there any response? Yeah. What kind of response? Came out over the highway and stopped directly in front of us. So that was the first time? In so it was sort of off to the side, but then after you waved out of the car? It, it, yeah, came out in front of us. That's a definite response. That's a definite response. I remember, Barney had been in the military World War II. Okay. He's curious. What kind of craft is this? Ah, so he's intellectual. He's never seen anything like this before in the military. Well, Barney was also an avid plane watcher as a hobby for yep. himself, wasn't he? Yep. Well, of course, he'd been in the military, World War II. Yeah. And he knew just about everything that flew. Right. 
So uh, when this craft stopped in midair in front of us, Barney's going to identify it, if possible. So he takes the binoculars, gets out of the car, and walks to the end of the craft, looking up at it. So you had stopped at the side of the road, and he now starts walking towards this craft? Yeah, and looking up at it, I'm sitting in the car. Now, how, how high or low was the craft at this point? It was quite low to the ground at this stage, wasn't oh, I'd it? Oh, I'd say 50 feet. 50 feet above the ground, out in a field. So no, at this point... It was you... right over the, in front of the highway, right in front of us. Oh, this wasn't over the field, it was no, on the it highway. Was, Barney walked towards it. Okay. But then it moved out, a uh, short ways out into the field. Okay. And he started walking out into the field towards it. What did you think when you saw him walking straight for this UFO that's only 50 feet off the ground? Well, you... I was wondering if he could identify it. <laughs> you weren't worried at all at that point? No. Okay. No, no fears, no nothing. You both are very intellectually curious. <laughs> so... And as Barney walks towards up, he's looking up through the binoculars, and he sees a light, like a big picture window, lighted, and he sees this group of men standing behind the window, looking down at him. Okay, so he sees beings on board this craft, several of them, looking out the window right at him on the ground, right. looking back through binoculars. And as he's watching, one of these men reach behind him, and it was like a panel on the wall. And he was moving lovers up and down. Hmm. And at that point, the graph started to descend. And as it did, a sort of a narrow wing came out on each side yes. with a red light at the end of the wing. So wings emerged suddenly. Yeah. Okay. And at this point, Barney knew it was something he'd never seen before. And... He had the feeling that they were coming down, they were going. To, they were trying to capture him. Now let's stop for one second there. The beings he saw on the craft, did they look like normal human beings? Uh, well, from what he could see, he assumed they were normal. He did at that yeah. stage? Yeah. Okay, because we do have sketches we can show the audience um, that they, as he got a closer look, looked pretty different. Okay, yeah. please go on. This is okay. riveting. So... As the craft becomes, begins to descend, mm -hmm. he becomes frightened, runs back to the car, yelling that they were trying to capture him. Mm -hmm. And we had to get out of there. Yeah, yes. So, now, he, he had, something happened with the binocular strap, this heavy, thick leather binocular yeah, strap when, around when, his neck. Uh, we didn't realize it at the time. But when he pulled the binoculars down from his eyes, he did it with such force that it actually broke the strap around his neck. And he actually had a sore neck for several yeah. days afterwards from that, didn't he? Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So he's running back to the car. Originally, he's out of sound shot from you because of being so far away. Were you trying to call out to him at all while he was in the field? Even though you said you weren't worried about him, did you try to call after him while well, he was out in the field? When the craft started to come down, I yelled to him. Okay. I'm yelling out, you know, get back in the car. I begin to sense danger at that point. Oh, you too. Okay. Right. All right. So something shifted. At first you were curious and calm. Then you both started to get worried. And he came back to the car yelling, they're going to capture us in a very high state of uh, fear and anxiety. Right. Okay. What happens now? So we went speeding down the highway. And uh, we just got in a short distance when we heard... A beeping, a strange beeping sound. Can you imitate that at all? I, I... No, not really. It was sort of tinny, but it was like beep, 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 beep like that. Okay, and a... And the whole car vibrated. Oh, was this painful or uncomfortable, the level of vibration? No, but it was just curiosity. Okay. You know, it was happening. Okay. And at that point, I put the window down and put my head out to see if I could see what was happening. And what did you see? And, uh... At that point, the, the UFO went over the roof of the car, Now, and then I lost it. I couldn't see it. 
Now, did you actually see the UFO, or was it that you couldn't see the star suddenly and assumed yeah, it? Well, it blocked the sky, and I could see the bottom of it. Could you see any markings or, or anything on the bottom of the UFO that stands out in your mind? No, nope, no markings. Okay, so you heard a beeping coming from the back trunk area of your car. Then you look out the window and see the UFO directly overhead. How low was it, Betty? Oh, just barely missing the roof. Oh, how large did it seem to you? That must have been unbelievable. Oh, it was very large. Because later, when we went back, we actually took measurements. And what did you, what was the measurement you came up with? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, the craft sure. was approximately 60 feet wide. 60. Uh, between 60 and 65. I would not want a 60-foot craft flying just inches above my car. That is very alarming to say the least and not only that missing the trees on both sides oh <laughs> oh that's right that's true mountainous roads in new hampshire are highly treacherous <laughs> oh for goodness sake so barney is probably driving a bit wildly and fast with this ufo practically landing on your roof yep. you're both a bit panicked and what happens now but then, after, then we calmed right down huh and all uh we were watching and we couldn't find the ufo it was gone Hmm. And we said, you know, well, they're gone. Okay. Well, they're about 30 miles south. Barney turns off the main highway onto a secondary road. Was this where you planned to go? No. No. Onto a, another a little narrow road. Now, he did this kind of abruptly, didn't he? Did it right. kind of startle you that... Uh, well, you see, I, I really didn't question it too much because... When Barney was traveling, he always studied maps, and he knew every shortcut there was. So you trusted So him. I just assumed this is a shortcut. Okay. Until we go about half a mile on this road, and there was a man that he saw on the craft standing in the middle of the road, blocking our way. So the, the, there's one particular being that he saw on the craft when it was over the field who now he recognized was the same one is standing in the middle of the road and the craft is where? On the ground. On the ground behind the being. Yep. In front of your car. In front of the car. Blocking your drive. Yep. Now, and... what, now what did you feel? Well, the motor of the car died. Oh, you And at that moment, I will admit that both Barney and I panicked. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Here we are alone, back mountain road, and here are these men. We don't know who they are. Okay. Then they you... separated, came up in two groups, took us out of the car. How many were there? All together, 11. 11. Yep. So five came up to you, five or six came up to Barney. Yep. And and how did you stay in the car? Did I mean? No. Uh, actually, when I saw them coming up, I sensed danger. Mm. I opened the car door, and I was going to get out and try and run and hide in the woods. Okay. But I didn't make it. <laughs> did I just got the door open, just started to get out, and they were standing right there in the doorway, blocking my way. Huh. Oh, dear. That and at be. that point, I went, uh, it was like a loss of memory. It was, for a couple of minutes, I couldn't remember what was happening. And I, whatever this was, I brought myself out of that. Yeah. And we're walking in a path in the woods. Okay. Now, I'm fully conscious. But Barney, they have Barney under some kind of control. And he's having trouble walking, mm. and they're more or less dragging him along. Now, are his feet dragging behind him? Yeah. Sort of like uh, the tops of his shoes are dragging and scraping right. along the ground as they're these... Yeah. and of course, later the tops of his shoes were all scuffed. Okay. Now, how tall are these uh, beings? Uh, um, they were about my height. And how tall are you, Betty? Five foot. So they were shorter than the average male at that time. Right. Okay. Because um, Barney was taller, than they, much taller than they were. But they were still managing to hold him up. 
Yep. Okay. And they had a hand, they were kind of holding you from either side as well, just like Barney? No, nope. I was sort of walking along on my own. All right. Were you at fully, now you said you were fully conscious. Did mm -hmm. you try to struggle at all or did you? Nope. I kept saying, Barney, 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 wake up. Okay. <laughs> I was you... trying to wake Barney up. Yes. yes. And I wasn't able to. And we came to where the craft was on the ground. And the lead, and, oh, and when I kept calling him Barney, the leader said, his name is Barney. And I said, none of your business. Ah, oh, you are, you get them. That's right. You're not going to cooperate with them. They're just dragging you off in the middle of the night. And so that, now we're at the door of the craft. Now, wait a minute. You said he kept asking you uh, or responding, his name is Barney. Did they talk to you the way, did they have mouths and yep. was there sound coming yep. out? Voices. Yep. They, they had voices. Right. And was clearly speaking English to you? Yeah. Well, they, with an accent. And what kind of accent? Did you ever figure no, it out? No, I never could figure it out. Never could. Okay. Nope. All right. So they're dragging you and Barney. Barney's unconscious, being dragged behind you. Now we're at the door of the craft, and he said, go on. And I said, no. You're going to And fuck. so they tried to pull me on. Oh, and that's when I put up a battle and my dress got torn. Oh, dear. And it was the second time I'd worn it. Oh, <laughs> that's never good. <laughs> what a waste of a good dress, huh? <laughs> and the oh. one that did the talking said, you know, go on. Well, you're not going to be harmed. All we want to do is some simple tests. And when the tests are over with, we'll take you back to your car and you'll be on your way home. So they were trying to encourage you, if you just get on, let us get, you know, get this over with, you'll be back at your car sooner. Right. You now, know. Now, did you trust that, believe it? What was your reaction? Well, I didn't have much choice at that moment. So, so we were taken inside. Barney went in first. Okay. And actually, it was a corridor. Hmm. And to go, there was two rooms side by side, and the door going into the room was oval shaped like you would find on a ship. Oh. And we had to step up to go into the room. Okay. It was and higher than the floor of the corridor. Now was the corridor straight and boxy? Can no, you... it curved. It was a curved interior corridor that led to two doorways, one of which you went into and one of which Barney was taken into and it was an oval doorway with a step up. Right. Okay. Yep. So, uh, uh, oh, so I went in, and there was, well, there seemed to be, the man who spoke English, we called him the leader. Okay. And he said they wanted to do some tests, simple tests. Mm. And then the man, uh, this other man came in, and we called him the examiner because he did the testing. Okay. And then the nine others stayed out in the corridor. Oh, okay. So we called them the crew members. Okay. For purposes of identification. Now, why do you think you and Barney were in separate rooms? Why? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I questioned that, and he said that he could only do testing of one at a time. Mm-hmm. So they, they would test me, and then he'd go into the next room where Barney was. Okay. Which is what happened. Okay. So if they brought you in at the same time, you'd have to, they'd be taking turns with you. So this right. was faster. Yes. Okay. They only had equipment for one person. Oh, okay. At a time. Was that more alarming to you to be separated from Barney at that stage? Nope. No? Nope. I, I, see, um, I'm it's sorry. a new situation. You, you know, I'm playing it by ear. I don't sure. know what's going to happen. Sure. For all I know, they might roast me for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not it's not a very funny thought actually. That's kind of that. Where how terrified were you at that time? Well, after I got inside, then I got over being afraid. Well, see, the leader was doing all he could to calm us down. Huh? I say we're not going to harm you. Okay. We we just want to find out how you were like us and different from us. Oh, really? Okay. And then as soon as we find that out. We're going to take you back to the car. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Did you think these were beings from another planet or galaxy or another world at that stage? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No question in your mind. No okay. question. All right. So uh, that made sense. These were astronauts from another solar system. All right. I was beginning to become impressed. 
I'm Absolutely. getting over my fears, and I've got a lot of curiosity now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, what, did, what was in that room that they brought you into? Because you went, didn't actually see the inside of Barney's room, but what... No, did... but they both, later we found out they were the same. Okay, yeah. because of descriptions later. Yeah. What... Actually, the rooms were pie-shaped, like a piece of pie. Oh, that makes sense if it was a round craft, huh? Right. And okay. uh, the lighting was all indirect lighting, ceiling and walls. Okay. And it was a bright blue light, very, very bright. And uh, there was like a little table and a stool. And was the table large enough for a normal adult human to fit no, on? No. Barney's legs were hanging over the edge. Oh, my. Okay. So it was a shorter table than you would expect. Right. Okay. Yep. And then there was a cabinet, huh. and then there was uh, some of the equipment they used. It was uh, on the wall. They just slid these doors back, and the equipment was sort of built into the wall. Huh. Okay. So, so they kind of reached up, took it off the wall, and then brought it over to where? No, they, was, no, they just slid the doors back. Slid the door back. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. So uh, now my examination... They, first of all, they put me on a stool, and they checked my eyes, ears, nose, throat. They were very interested in my feet. Uh, they took samples of my hair. How? Did they cut it uh, or pull it out? or uh, They cut it. They cut it. So they had, was it a scissor like we're familiar I with? I don't know. It was, I, I couldn't see what they, I knew they cut it, but I don't know what they used. And when they looked in your eye, you know when you go to an eye doctor, they have a thing that lights up the inside of your eye or your ear. Did, they, did anything look familiar to you? No. They didn't, no lights. No lights. They no. just were looking and leaning forward and looking. Yeah. And did any of this hurt at this stage? No. Not yet. Okay. And they also took a scraping of my skin. Hmm. And then they said they were going to check my nervous system. And they had these, this equipment in the wall. And they pulled these wires out. And they were touching me. Did that hurt? No. No. So they were touching you, not poking you with wires. And no, no they shocks. were putting, you know, touching them. Okay. And, and reading this machine. Oh. Wow. And then he said they were going to do a pregnancy test. Now, how old were you at this stage, by the way, if you don't mind saying? Forty. Forty. Okay. Yeah. The, all right. So they're going to do a pregnancy test. And this is when he tried to put a needle-like instrument in my navel, which caused pain, so he stopped doing it. Okay. Now, yeah. let's spend a minute on that, though. Actually, before they were about to do the pregnancy test, did you say anything or express anything to them? No, nope, but when I saw the needle, yeah, I said, don't do it. It will hurt. You warned them. And he them. said, no, it shouldn't hurt. Uh-huh. And the, when it did hurt, he was amazed. And he stopped doing it. So did they stop or did they also do something to take care of the pain as well, I understand? Well, he sort of uh, rubbed, uh, push, put his hand back and forth in front of my eyes. Huh. And that stopped the pain. So not only did they pull out, even after they pulled the needle out, it still was very painful. He waved his hand in front of your eyes a few times, and all the pain went away. Right. And what feeling did you have after they had done this intrusive procedure, even though they stopped when you uh, expressed pain? Well, at that point, my exam was over with, uh -huh. and the examiner went into the next room to uh, give Barney his exam. Okay. And now this, with Barney, the first part was the same as mine. Okay. The eyes, ears, nose, throat skin, hair, fingernails. And then they rolled him over on his stomach, and he, they seemed to be mostly interested in his bone structure. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know? So, but now, the examiner is in with Barney, and I'm beginning to feel like I'm going to be out of there soon, okay. and I'm relaxed, and I said to the leader, I need something to take home with me to prove this has happened. <laughs> You're looking for that ashtray off the UFO, aren't you? <laughs> or that matchbook cover, something, huh? <laughs> and actually, there was a book. Oh, what did this book look like? I find this fascinating. So, he said I could have the book. He was going to give you a book off this craft? Right. And now, so I'm standing there. Oh, 
I'm by the cabinet, and I'm looking briefly through the book, looking for pictures. Yeah. Because I did see the printing. Now, what did the printing look like? Does it look like anything you have ever seen from any culture or time? Yep, oriental. It looked oriental. Why? Was it left uh, to right? Well, because, it, well, it was a much simpler script than Japanese. Okay. Or Chinese. But it went up and down in columns instead of across. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then uh, I'm looking at the book, and the examiner comes running back into the room where I am opens my mouth and starts tugging at my teeth. Tugging at them, pulling at your teeth gently, huh? Yep. And, and so I said, you know, I said, what's wrong? Yeah. And the leader said, we're puzzled. Barney's teeth come, are removable and yours are not. Why? <laughs> <laughs> now, why is that? <laughs> Actually, World War II, Barney got hit, I don't know, a hand grenade or something. And then knocked all his teeth out. So Barney had dentures. And, and he they, had dentures. They figured everybody's teeth came out as a full set and were removable. <laughs> yeah, That's adorable. Out why his teeth came out and mine did not. So did they ask you, did you try to explain what that was about? Yes. Did they understand? Um, I'm not really sure if they did. Now what, what does it take? How did you describe, how did you try to explain the dentures? I said that, well... Barney's had been as a result of an accident, but as we get older, then uh, many of us, we lose our teeth, you know? And, uh, what, and what baffled We have to have them extracted. Right. And then this led into, a, well, eat, what do you eat? Well, he said, what is age, right? Yep. He was asking me what's age, and I'm saying this many years we live, and... What's diet? I'm trying to explain about foods. That that affects... And he's not understanding me. Yeah, you were trying to explain that, you know, sometimes as people get older, they lose their teeth, and then they... And as they age, and he says, what's age? And you're trying to explain how different things affect how long a pe person lives, right. such as the diet they eat. And then you're trying to explain food, and this conversation just kind of fell apart. because no, I tried... Well, I said, I'll tell you about squash. Because that's your favorite food. Uh, yeah. And then I said, the first thing I said, it's yellow. And he said, what's yellow? So he didn't, uh, he spoke English, but in a limited way. Okay. Yeah. So, so that conversation, you were working on it, but it was difficult. Now, um, he also showed you something fascinating, and this is one of the most compelling components of your case. Well, I said to him... I know you're not from this planet. Where are you from? And this is when he showed me the star map. He showed you a star map. Right. And we have drawings of your star map. You drew it later after right. the event. Yep. And he said the broken lines were expeditions. That his... Places they'd been once or twice. Okay. And then the other lines, the solid lines, were places they went frequently or all the time. Oh, my. And, of course, later I sketched the star map. I now, were, was Earth on this map? Yes. It was? We, we were a spot where they go frequently. Oh. Now, the, it, let's, let's take a minute to say, did, when you drew the map originally after this event, did anybody recognize that system? Not at first. Now, how long did it take before people recognized that star system? Well, most of the research was done by a woman by the name of Marjorie Fish. And uh, she worked at Oak Ridge at the nuclear, I don't know, nuclear, they do something nuclear. Facility? Okay. Oh, it's a nuclear facility. Okay. And she was a scientist, and she was curious about the star map to see if it really existed. And she took boxes and put strings down, and she started out putting us in our solar system in the middle of working out and getting rid of all the stars that we think could not possibly have life. Okay. And when she got through, that was my star map <gasps> almost completed. You mean she did that independently of looking at your map? Yep. Oh, for heaven's sake. So in her but mind... She had to get acquainted with every star so she, in, in her the na neighborhood. That is fascinating, and it was the same, almost the same map as yours. What, what year was, was that? 
Well, she she didn't complete the research until 1970. Okay, it was many because years. Because I had two stars on the map, and our astronomers had not found them yet. When did they find those other stars? That 1970. You 1970. So you, in 1961. So I had two map, two stars, two stars on the map that we had not found yet. Oh my! For and nine in 1970, years. we found them. Oh, fantastic evidence! I absolutely love that. And not only that, that pattern of stars can be seen only south of Mexico City. Oh. So it wasn't anything I looked up and saw in the sky. Fascinating. Oh, nope. Betty, this is just one of the most exciting aspects of this case. Now, do you need to take a quick break? Yes, I should. You should. Okay, so we're going to stay on the air, absolutely. And you come back as soon as you're done, and uh, we'll continue from where we left off at, towards the end of your exam, and you are just got through looking at the star map, and we'll pick up from there when you get back, okay? Okay, I'll be right back. Thank All right. You. All right. Now, so we have been talking. This is, of course, the UFO connection, and we have been talking with Betty Hill. All right. I think I'm supposed to switch cameras. Now, just to give you some background information, where a lot of this information, uh, a lot of this has been written down, Betty and Barney Hill. Barney, unfortunately, passed away in 1969 of a very severe stroke and died suddenly. But um, their story has been written up. One of the most famous versions of their story is The Interrupted Journey by John Fuller. I have a very old, whoops, I see the, let me just pick it up here. And in this book, we have some very amazing pictures that, um, of the star map, of the people involved. We're going to be getting to further versions later. Uh, and this actually has transcripts word by word. We haven't gotten it to it yet, but afterwards they underwent a great deal of hypnosis with a clinical medical doctor and psychiatrist to retrieve a lot of their memories. Uh, they had a lot to begin with, but more came back later through, excuse me, through the hypnosis, but also in a remarkable series of articles in the MUFON UFO journal from September 2001. And it's just amazing for those of you who, you know, don't have these uh, um, articles or books available, I'm certain you could find it on the web. Like I said, they are by far the most important and significant abduction case that has ever occurred. And what we're going to be getting to um, a little bit in a few minutes when Betty returns back on the air, we're going to talk about the enormous list of physical evidence that remained and how... The thing that I also want you to know is the level of credibility that for over 40 years, nobody, a hardcore scientist or anybody, have been able to punch holes into their story. It has truly been examined in detail and is magnificent. So um, I hope you do take the time to look into this case a little bit more. It's, it's, if you haven't, I'm sure a lot of our viewers being so savvy have, but if you haven't, it's just to get the level of detail. I've immersed myself recently in the case, and it's absolutely fascinating. So um, basically what we're doing now is waiting for Betty Hill. I'm back. She's back. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Thank you. Good. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I want to hear more. Okay. Can we pick up right where we left off? You're on the craft. You've just been shown the star map. You're mm -hmm. done with your physical exam, and you're holding this book. Does it have pages like we have in normal books with a thick cover and normal paper feeling pages? It was a very similar to an encyclopedia. So what only the pages were very, very smooth and mm -hmm. stiff. Okay. Now, now what color were the pages and the ink or the writing on white it? White with black print. Same as our books. Yep. Okay. Yep. Have you ever ever written down any of the letters or words or symbols that you saw in that book? Oh, I did years ago. Oh. I and uh, I, I'm very involved in archaeology, and any time I see any ancient writings, I check it out. Um, no success. No success. Have no. you shown it to other linguists? Oh, yeah. Several people have worked on it. And has anybody ever said it looks somewhat like this, or has anybody... Nope. Have Totally no, unfamiliar. Very interesting. Yep. Okay, so now you're holding this book. Yep, and I'm ready to, the, the, after I saw the star map and all, yeah. they brought the, the, they're bringing Barney out of the room. And how does he look And he's now? leaving the craft, so I pick up the book, and I start to go out behind him. When the crew members start yelling. Now, and they, they make it? Checked into my having the book. 
Now, did they make actual sounds? Oh, yeah. What they were of... mad. You could what... tell from the tone of voice they were furious. Were they using words or... Well, I couldn't understand what they were saying. They had a language of their own. I know in the book it was described as like, mm, like uh, humming almost. But... Almost like a humming sound. Almost yeah. like a humming. Okay. Yep. So anyway, they're all... So the leader took the book back. Oh. What did he say or what did you say? Oh, I became angry at first. Yeah. And then he said he would walk part of the way back to the car with me. And he said, I have to take the book back because yeah. the crew he members said, don't want you to remember or have... Right. Don't he said, I have no objections to you having your book, the book, but they do. So it's obviously a community agreement yeah. concept among them, even yeah. though he's the leader. So by that leading Barney... And then I leave the craft, and the leader starts walking with me. And he gets almost up to the car, and he stops. And he's going to leave. And I said to him, this has been the greatest experience of my life. I have been honored to meet you. I have many friends who would like to meet you. Will you please come back? And he said, I don't know. It's not my decision to make. So even... So I said, well, if you decide to come back, how will I know this? And he said, you will know somehow. Oh. And with that... Oh, and then he said, uh, stay by the car, and you'll be far enough away from the craft so that you won't be in any, in any danger when we leave. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so I went up to the car... And Barney's sitting in the car, and I say, come on, get out, watch him leave. And I picked up the dog, my dog Delcy, a, do a dachshund. Uh-huh. And we're standing there, we're watching the craft leave. It becomes surrounded with this red, fiery substance. It looks almost like fire, but it's not. Wow. It out of it, and it dips up. And I'm saying to the dog, Delcy, look at this. You may be the only dog in the world to see this. <laughs> and she's scared to death. She's got her head tucked under my arm. Oh. She won't look. Oh. So we got in the car and we come home. Oh. So the whole time you and Barty were on the craft, Delcy, your Dotson, was cowering and staying put in the car without you, scared. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So you watched, so even though you had been, you know, against your will, both you and Barney dragged out of your car, given a physical exam, underwent some degree of physical pain, you still felt honored to have met them and were hoping to have a future encounter when right. it was all Why over. Why come back? Okay. So no. you watch the craft fly away. You mm -hmm. get back in the car. Now what happens? We There's drive even home. more. We drive home and we get home and... Uh, Uneventfully, you get home, something yeah. happens. Wasn't there something? No. Wasn't there some missing time? Or... Oh, well, when we got home, Barney said, you know, gosh, the trip took longer than what it should. About two hours longer, at right, least. Right, about two hours longer. And then we found a highly polished spot from the trunk of the car, apparently where the beeping sounds had originated. So on, when you went to look at the trunk of your car, on the surface, there were highly polished, perfectly round surfaces. Yep. Like marks or something. Shiny the... spots. Now, there was more beeping on the way home. See, there's a segment that after you, the UFO flew oh, off. Oh, uh, when we got back, yeah, we, we left the craft. When we got back on the main highway, okay. they beeped us again. Okay, and and, and this is when I said, I don't know who, where they're going, but I wish them good luck. Now, you had kind of a shift in consciousness as well when that beeping occurred, didn't you? Yeah. What would you say your state of consciousness was right after the craft flew away, you were driving, and, you know, and right after you heard the beep about uh, 30 minutes later? Well, like, particularly with Barney, he was fully conscious. Okay. But even before that. Okay. He still thought of, oh, how would I put it? He was sort of dazed. Dazed. Yeah. But when we heard the second beeping sound, he was wide awake. 
Okay, it was like something shifted in this fog or daze or haze. Yeah. It was lifted off you instantly from that sound. Right. And then after you got home, there actually were physical marks left on your car. How long did those marks remain on your car? Oh, the, the marks stayed there for months. Even though you polished and waxed the car, did they always still stand yeah, out? they stayed there for months. They stayed there for months. Yeah. Now, did you do any um, testing on those spots after you got home? Uh, well, we talked with a physicist who said put a compass around them, see what happens. So you did that the next day after you got right. home? Right, and the compass was very erratic. Okay, and meaning it, it, was... it, it reacted differently over those spots than any other place. On the car. Right. And they were spinning wildly when you held it near the polished spots, but not when you moved it a few inches to the side. Right. Yep. Okay. And then the tops of Barney's shoes were scuffed. Now, Barney is very, was, from what I read, is, was very meticulous about his appearance and couldn't figure out how the tops of his shoes were his scuffed. His new shoes. New shoes. Oh, <laughs> you both lost your wardrobe on this trip. Okay, so his shoes were scuffed. What else? What about your watches? Wasn't and there... both our watches have stopped functioning. Now, w did they both stop at the exact same time? We don't know. Oh, you can't because, remember? Because, you know, his watch stopped. Well, your watch stops, and you wind it up, and you set it and try to get it going again. Oh, of course, it's the and day. That's what we did, so oh, we God. never did really know what time. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Okay. But, uh... Now, what about your dress? Okay, now, my dress, I took it off, and I put it in the back of the closet, and about three weeks later, I went to get my dress, and it was covered with a pink powdery substance. Did it have a smell to it or anything? Or not that I noticed. And what was the texture like? Baby powder, like the yeah, it was like a. Uh, yeah, I would say sort of like a talcum powder. Okay. But it was pink. Pink. Mm. And I put the dress outdoors, and the powder blew away. Oh goodness. But it left pink stains all over my dress. Now, can you account for what that was? Did they do anything to you during the, uh, the encounter that you remember them touching you in a certain spot? No. Nope. And uh, ever since then, and different labs have tried to analyze. In fact, right now there's an attempt being made oh. to try to analyze what would cause pink stains. We know what would cause blue. The dress was blue. Okay. So we knew what would cause blue stains or gray stains, but no idea what causes pink. Fascinating. Well, I, I would love to hear when you get the results back from that test. That could, if they are able to determine it, maybe they we don't have sophisticated enough equipment. Also, your dress from struggling. What happened? Yeah, to my your, dress was torn. Your dress was torn. Yeah. So, so that and dress. It was, have, it was one of these dresses that had the built-in lining. Yes. So. Oh. And the lining is all torn. Oh, dear. Do you still have all that? All the seams were torn out. Oh, my. Do you still have that dress, Betty? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yep. <laughs> that is a, a famous uh, dress to hang on to, I must say. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Then, uh, we'll see. Now, you uh, had so much. When you got home, how did you feel when you first got home? Like, my goodness, what a harrowing experience. You kind of walk in your house late at night, later than you expected. We got home about 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my. And actually, we both felt the only way we could describe it is contaminated. Huh. So we both took long showers, shampooed our hair and all. Wow. But we did not bathe the dog. And I would say two weeks afterwards, she had all kinds of skin rashes. Oh, my. I didn't know We that. had her back and forth to the vets for two years. Oh, dear. Do you think there was some kind of... Whoops, we're having a little feedback here. Do you think that was some kind of radiation exposure or from that pink dust off your dress? I don't know, but whatever it was, she was very uncomfortable. Oh. I mean, she had big boils. Oh, dear. Did that, is that a symptom of radiation exposure? I have no idea. Okay. All and right. And the vet didn't know what was doing. He just said she came in something that didn't contact with something that did not agree with her. Yeah. Now, did you or Barney, uh, oh, could we get rid of the feedback in here? Did you or Barney have any illness as a result of your encounter? No, not then. Oh. No. And then, okay. uh, Good. Now, what about how were your emotions after the fact? 
as much as you felt good about that encounter, what was your overall emotional state following this event, like over the next few weeks and months? Yeah, well, uh, Bonnie wanted to forget all about it. He didn't want to talk about it because he couldn't explain it. Kind of like a resistance thing. He just no. doesn't know and what me, to make of it. Just make it go away. And I, me, I was fascinated. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I reported it to the police. Now, what did the police say? Did they make fun of you? They told me to call Pease Air Force Base and report it. Now, what did they say? So I called Pease Air Force Base. Now, they had a special responsibility in 1961, actually. They were, in fact, collecting UFO reports at the time, weren't yep. they? And, uh, well, they called us back several times. And then one time they said that uh, our phone call was going to another base, okay. not Pease. Okay. And then later, uh, that was the beginning. Now, uh, what, was there from any... From then on, Bonnie and I, every Friday night, we're out at the officers' club. <laughs> so you got We do office... all the pilots. Uh-huh. Yep. I don't... Uh, now, unfortunately, we're going to run out of time soon, which I can't believe it went that fast. This is just horrible. But um, tell me, did they find any, um, did the Air Force or the Air Base have any evidence to corroborate your story? Well, uh... That was another thing we learned, was that they had picked the craft up on radar and sent up two military planes to check it out. And from their report, we know that the craft left at 2.14 a.m. Oh. So yeah. they, the, the military base, the Air Force base, picked that your craft up on radar, and there's radar evidence that they were, in fact, in the vicinity that you said they were at the time you said they were. Yep. Oh, yep. boy. And they weren't making fun of you at all. In fact, they actually um, took your case and treated it very seriously, correct? Oh, we were. Uh, well, I had continuing contacts from th that time up until the time the base closed, which was, I think, 1986. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. Now, yep. you also... And not only that, uh, I used to go at the invitation of the Air Force. Used to go around to Air Force bases and lecture on UFOs. You're kidding. You were invited by military Air Force bases to lecture on UFOs? Oh, yeah. Oh, Betty, that's incredible. That is incredible. Good for you. But not only that, oh. after a while, somebody would call to report a UFO and they'd tell them to call me. Called? The Culture of New Hampshire, just a nice book about the culture of New Hampshire where you live. And yep. you were, go ahead, you were uh -huh. asked to write a chapter. Uh -huh. I wrote it on the history of UFOs in New Hampshire. So New Hampshire, you also told me, is very open-minded and accepting about UFOs, aren't they? Right. In fact, uh, the earliest reports that I have go back to 1932 uh -huh. because they had no name for them. They just call them flying things. <laughs> okay. And they were seen about every two years wow. up until World War II. Wow. And because World War II, we had the volunteers sitting out nights, all night, watching the skies for enemy planes. Oh. And then they would see these lights in the sky, would call the report in to a central location, and that person... At that time, we didn't have Pease Air Force Base here. They would call the reports in to the Air Force Base in Plattsburgh, New York, and the planes there would come out and check out these strange lights. In and fact, there were thousands of them. Wow. In fact, the night of your event, the Air Force Base actually sent two military craft to check out what they were picking up on radar, too. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now... Apparently, you also told me that New Hampshire, in your local paper, on the front page, there was a whole article. There were so many UFO reports coming in that they said, "If you, tell us what the article said real quickly, because we're almost out of time. Oh, it said, if you see a UFO, do not call 911. It's not an emergency. Because too many calls were coming in. I just love it. Now, and one more important thing I want the viewers to hear. You told me since that event, up until they built a development, a housing development, you had huge open space that you could see from your home, you know, a, a big open area. What has been happening every night for 15 years? UFOs coming in. You have... See, 
about six weeks after the experience itself, Barney and I came home one night and found a pile of dried leaves on the kitchen table. Uh huh. And in the pile of dried leaves was my blue earrings that I was wearing that night. That disappeared the night of your abduction, and six weeks later they mysteriously appeared on your kitchen table. Kitchen table. Is yeah. that when the sightings in your area and began? It was soon after that. And how? That how many, do you think it was the same beings and craft that you encountered the night of your abduction? That had to, brought, had to bring back the earrings, and yes. Okay. Uh, that, well, then when Barry and I would go out at night, we'd drive along and UFOs would pa uh, pace our car. And sometimes they'd put on a little show for us. Yeah. And so then the, in this one town... About, I would say at least 50% of the people set out every night, along with lots of other people, for about 15 years and observed UFOs.